Hello. 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 <laughs> sorry, sorry. Hey. It was a good fall, right? So, so remember this applause that you just did. First of all, uh, did everyone have a great lunch? Are you sleepy from having ate a big lunch? Yes. All right, so we're going to do a little warm-up exercise because you are going to give a super energetic round of applause for Mr. Dotan, who's from Logs.io, and he's been involved with uh, a bit of a legal talk in some sense. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, Dotan, everyone. Hey everyone, uh, great being here. The one that are up there, lots of room here. If you want to uh, come closer, it'd be great. And uh, you'll have much more fun being close to me and for me being able to see you because it's very difficult to see everyone from, uh, from up here. Uh, I'm very excited to be here at uh, Config Management Camp, finally, after uh, all these years of hearing the good stories about that. And let's start with this. Imagine waking up one morning to find out that your beloved open source uh, database or any other library or tool at the heart of your system uh, is being relicensed. And uh, that's not just a horror story, actually uh, it happened to me and to my company twice in the past two years alone. Uh, it was a painful and uh, an insightful experience and uh, I'd like to use the coming minutes to share with you some of these insights. My name is Dotan Horvitz. I'm uh, the principal developer advocate at uh, Logs.io. Uh, Logs.io provides a cloud-native observability platform that's based on popular open source tools such as Elasticsearch, uh, Prometheus, uh, uh, Grafana, OpenTelemetry and others. So and you'll see uh, how, it how it's relevant very soon. Uh, I'm an advocate of open source and uh, communities. Uh, in general, and the uh, CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation in particular, I uh, uh, co-organized the local CNCF chapter in uh, Israel. So if you're around, do uh, come and join us on one of our meetups, or we're going to actually have next month the first Kubernetes Community Days in Israel. Woo! So uh, uh, that's exciting. Uh, I hope to see more of these. I'm also an organizer of the DevOps Days Tel Aviv. I actually saw some familiar faces that uh, were uh, speakers at uh, DevOps Days Tel Aviv. And in general, you can find me everywhere at Horovitz, Mastodon, Twitter, Medium, whatever. So uh, hope to keep in touch. And let's start with the story uh, of what happened to us about two years ago. It was the beginning of 2021, uh, the second week of January, uh, everyone coming back from the holiday vacations, happy like you see in the picture, kick-starting the new year, and then one morning a bomb dropped on us. Uh, in January 2021, uh, we saw this announcement, uh, like many others, uh, announcing that Elasticsearch and uh, uh, Kibana were being relicensed from uh, Apache 2.0 to a dual license, uh, SSPL uh, and Elastic license. And to make things even more interesting, this was due to take place effective uh, the upcoming version, version 7.11, back then it was 7.10, so in just a matter of few weeks, less than a month, that is going to be a done deal. Um, and uh, is, is everyone familiar, by the way, with the Elk stack? Who, who knows the Elk stack? Just with the show of hands? Okay, so everyone's familiar. Uh, so you know uh, what it means. Uh, for us specifically, Elasticsearch uh, database is at the core of our system. As you understood uh, from, from what we do, it's a critical system. Uh, and we've been investing in tweaking and uh, optimizing it for our use cases for uh, years. So. You could not imagine the, the level of confusion that seeing this uh, note caused. And actually, the confusion was even greater because the, this announcement that I told you about was titled Doubling Down on Open. And the, um, the announcement said, uh, if you can see uh, the highlighted section, um, the, this license change ensures our community and customers have free and open access uh, 
uh, to use, modify, redistribute, and collaborate on the code. Yes? Free and open. Like free and open source software, uh, doubling down on open. Perhaps it's, it's not so bad as it seems. Perhaps SSPL is actually uh, open source and everything's okay. And uh, we weren't the only one being confused, actually. Uh, uh, a few days afterwards, the OSI, the Open Source uh, Initiative, uh, uh, issued a very uh, unique, uh, uncommon statement, uh, clarifying, declaring that SSPL is not open source, uh, that it does not comply with the open source definition, uh, because it discriminates against fields of endeavor, uh, and essentially clarifying, this is a Foxpen source license. And this is very important, people get it confused, Source available is not open source, okay? It's a Foxpen source license. Um, so, as you could imagine, uh, there was a, a lot of shock and rage in the community, not just by us, of course. You uh, immediately saw raging, uh, uh, raging posts, uh, articles, uh, doubling down on open, uh, not open at all. Um, Elasticsearch and Cabana are now business risks. Uh, Elastic promises open but delivers proprietary, and my favorite one, a meme of an angry bunny, bunny rabbit. So that's the level of angry that people got. Um, and shortly after that, uh, people start calling to fork uh, Elasticsearch and Cabana projects to keep them open. Uh, this is my, uh, the CTO of my uh, company, uh, immediately stating our mission statement being as I mentioned, open source first for all of our customers. So uh, teaming up with whoever is from the community is willing to do that and, and making the, this fork happen. Uh, a far greater uh, player in the industry, Amazon, came up uh, with the announcement that they're going to uh, step up and uh, make this fork happen. We have some distinguished gentlemen here from uh, AWS. Uh, they can probably share more about this journey. Um, no. <laughs> Who said I was talking about you? <laughs> uh, on the social media, it was very clear. People very clearly voted, uh, saying that uh, uh, they would prefer open source uh, fork of that sort over uh, uh, an SSPA licensed uh, Elastic version. Uh, and that as soon as a uh, fork uh, is made available, they will switch over from Elasticsearch to that fork. So this was the sentiment back then. Um, and what happened, uh, what happened to us, what happened to the others, I'll get back to that very soon. But first let's, uh, let's take a step, a step back and understand what is open source anyway. And unlike what was presented, I'm not going to have a legal talk. Uh, every one of you, I assume, knows uh, all the uh, open source licensing, uh, all the uh, OSI certified, whether Apache or MIT or BSD and all these, and there are lots of talks and lots of material about that. But the question is, is having open source uh, enough to qualify an open source project? Um, and who guarantees that the open source license won't change? And actually, who can change the license? These are the questions that I want to discuss and to make sure that everyone is clear about. And in the OSI's old website, I think they changed it since then, there was this slogan that I really, really like. It says, guaranteeing the R in source. And following the same vein, I would s suggest you to ask yourselves in each and every one of these junction points, who is the hour in source? Who governs your open source? And essentially, there are three main categories for that. Uh, first, there's the open source de developed by individuals, free maintainers. Uh, that's actually the vast majority of projects on, on GitHub. Um, I gave you a few uh, examples, popular examples like uh, 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 Curl. You know, uh, you have millions of uh, devices from your car to your washing machine running on this, and there's a, a single maintainer behind this project. Or um, uh, Log4j. We all remember the uh, Log4Shell vulnerability, and through the vulnerability, we saw how many 
use. I think so something like 8% of all of Maven repository was somehow dependent on this, uh, on this library, two maintainers. So that's, that's the case for many, many projects, the vast majority. Uh, the other type is projects uh, run by vendors. We saw the example of Elasticsearch and Kibana. They, they're run by uh, Elastic NV. Uh, there's the uh, example of Grafana, uh, by Grafana Labs, uh, uh, Mongo, uh, and many others that you probably know. And the last category is foundational open source. Linux with the Linux Foundation, Kubernetes with the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, Kafka, Apache Foundation, Clips Foundation, and so on. And this category is slightly different than the previous ones because here you get uh, a governance to ensure uh, vendor neutrality or entity neutrality to make sure that there's no one entity, and it doesn't matter if it's vendor or uh, an individual, that controls the, uh, the project, which gives obviously a, a bit more of a, of a uh, confidence level, not guaranteeing, but, but uh, it is an aspect to consider. So that, that's about who governs the open source. And why, is, why does that matter? I won't, I'm going to show you that uh, very soon. Now I'd like to look at some case studies of open source turning to the dark side. As you could guess, I'm a bit of a Star Wars geek. So uh, may the open source be with you. <laughs> Live long and prosper. And whoever comes, that's a different one. And we'll talk about your, uh, your uh, understanding of the uh, material. But anyway, come afterwards and I'll give you a sticker of may the open source be with you. For those who survived my talk. Um, so let's start with the uh, first uh, case study about uh, open source going non-open source. And for that, I want to go back to the uh, case study of Elasticsearch. Uh, so we saw this announcement before, and Elastic, uh, Elastic. This is what's known, by the way, as the rights ratchet. So you get in, you be pulled in by by an open source, and then starts being tightened uh, in. Um, and Elastic explained that he did that to fight off uh, uh, competitors, such as G this gentleman from AWS, uh, that is making use and profit over the, using the uh, the open source, but not contributing back. That's the the claim that they had. Um, and by the way, Elastic NV is not a small startup in its own right. It's a public company. It's a eight point something billion uh, US dollars worth. Uh, uh, but as a side note, but the main thing is that it didn't end up here. So the Elk stack has more than just Elasticsearch and Kibana. Uh, and uh, the other pieces remained Apache 2.0. However, they started introducing breaking changes uh, to these pieces. Uh, to start mainly the, the shippers, the ones that send uh, the, the, the <coughs> telemetry, the logs and so on to uh, the backend uh, service to make a check, like let's uh, take an example Filebit, that's a very popular agent that collects and uh, reads the log lines from your local file system and sends it off to, your, to your, uh, an Elasticsearch cluster and they introduced a check uh, to make sure that the backend remote cluster is certified. Uh, and if not, people who upgraded this uh, just broke, stopped working. So it happened with uh, uh, Filebit and many other bits, uh, Logstash, uh, client libraries. Uh, you started seeing these sorts of uh, tweets and, and uh, social media with angry developers finding out these checks inside the source code of, um, of many of these libraries. Um, and I think this is the best description uh, of that. For those who don't know Elastic, uh, Elasticsearch, it's like imagine the reaction of Oracle's MySQL team if they uh, decided to fix MySQL client libraries so that they could only connect to an official MySQL ver version. That's the equivalent for those who come from the relational databases. So uh, as I mentioned, the community reacted with a fork that was ultimately named OpenSearch, uh, currently uh, led by AWS together with uh, Red Hat, SAP, uh, my company Logs.io and others. Um, and OK, you'd say just hit the button, fork, and that's it, right? That's what open source is built for. Uh, but apparently it wasn't that easy at all. Uh, there were many uh, code smells. And you, as you can see here, this is a, a snippet from the OpenSearch community updates uh, on the forking work. 
And the thing is that developers that jumped into the source code quickly realized that Elasticsearch and Kibana code base was entangled between the open source piece, the Apache 2.0, and the proprietary XPAC uh, 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 source code to the level that sometimes they need to go line by line in order to, uh, to uh, uh, distinguish and to uh, take them apart. Uh, and in addition to that, there were all sorts of other things you can see here, like um, uh, embedded uh, marketing, branding elements, RSS feeds, pop-up messages, dial home features, telemetry, telemetry fetched, uh, and so on. So, um, uh, it was, if you want to, by the way, hear more about that, I have a, a, a podcast called uh, Open Observability Talks, as I mentioned. So, there was a very fascinating talk with uh, Kyle uh, about that. Uh, he shared a lot of insights about this process. So, uh, a very cool episode. <coughs> and... Uh, uh, at the end, uh, back in uh, July 21, uh, which was less than half a year, very impressive to the level of the code, the work that needed to be done, uh, the, it was GA'd, um, and many moved uh, subsequently from Elasticsearch, sorry, to, uh, uh, to OpenSearch. Um, some big names that, uh, that I wrote down, Dow Jones, Goldman Sachs, Pinterest, SAP, Zoom, Rackspace, Obviously, Amazon moved there, Logs.io, my company, uh, migrated, uh, and now it's a, it's a project on its own right, OpenSearch and OpenSearch dashboard. So that's one case study of open source going non-open source. But remember that what I said at the beginning, open source isn't just about OSI licensing. And things can happen all, even within the OSI realm, for example, uh, going copyleft. And for that I want to uh, uh, introduce the case study of Grafana. Grafana, very popular open source, everyone knows that for uh, dashboarding, metrics, right? Uh, anyone doesn't know Grafana? Okay. <laughs> Just checking if people are awake. Okay, so um, uh, in April 2021, same year, Grafana Labs announced relicensing Grafana. Paul, you said you didn't hear about that. This is the interesting part. No, just kidding. <laughs> Grafana, Loki, and Tempo from Apache 2.0 to AGPL version 3. And they explained it by the need to balance the open source with uh, their monetization strategy. Again, boiling down to the same thing of competitors leveraging uh, the open source. Now, AGPL version 3 is an open source license. It's approved by the OSI, so you may ask, so what's, what's the problem, right? And the problem is that people, like my company that used to use it, uh, discovered that the open source tool uh, that they use is suddenly uh, an infectious open source. So, uh, and, and an example by Google, for instance. Google, this is the official public uh, uh, policy, open source policy. Uh, they're all in favor of using open source internally, but for AGPL, the policy clearly states uh, that they forbid it, they ban AGPL, uh, saying simply that the risks uh, heavily overweigh the benefits. And this is the case to many other vendors. So wh why is copyleft licensing uh, so, so problematic? What, I what is it? And uh, remember, I'm not a lawyer, so do consult with your lawyers, but to, pay, to put in, in plain words, using AGPL, um, <coughs> sorry, uh, using AGPL software uh, means that uh, anything that, uh, if you modify it, anything that you touch, that it touches, uh, needs to also be availab made available uh, under the same license. So in a way, it sort of spreads virally. This is why I, I call it uh, contagious or infectious. Uh, this effect and, and actually specifically AGPL, uh, this version uh, has uh, also uh, another clause, section 13, that says that also interacting with over the internet, over a network uh, connection, I don't remember the exact uh, terminology in the legal terms, um, uh, will make effect. So uh, you don't even need to somehow package and, and send it to a customer to say, hey, now it's being delivered. Uh, and if you take Google or any other SaaS company that uh, all the interaction is over the internet, obviously all the usage, uh, that, that plainly becomes a, a business risk. Okay? Um, 
And uh, I would say that even if you use it internally, by the way, it could be problematic if you have, for example, uh, vendors, contractors, third parties that, that work for you, temps. Uh, it doesn't really matter in terms of the licensing. If it's an internal user, external user, you may also be exposed. So uh, it's, it's a, a bit tricky. Um, and the thing is that um, with, 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 this, uh, with this sort of a license, uh, it's not only problematic for vendors, so I gave the example of Google and other SaaS, but also for open source uh, projects. You decide that your project should be Apache 2.0, you use some sort of a library or an SDK or something, and suddenly you're, you're forced to change the license. Uh, to the extent that uh, the CNCF released very clear announcements following that, saying that uh, AGPL is problematic um, uh, for them and instructing their uh, project, all the CNCF's project, to either switch to an alternative uh, solution or to freeze and not upgrade to the relicensed version, stay with the version that is Apache 2.0. So it's problematic also for, for open source. So that's uh, uh, the examples of uh, uh, open source going uh, uh, non-open source and open source uh, going copyleft uh, with vendors, but things can happen not just with vendors. And for that I brought a case study of uh, two popular uh, open source frameworks, uh, Colors and Feka. Uh, both of them are MI were MIT licensed. Yeah. And very, I, I'm sure very, all of you will agree, very permissive license. And uh, both maintained by a single uh, person, a single individual, uh, Marak Squares. Uh, a single open source maintainer, free on his own time. And then, earlier last year, Marak deleted the open source. Deleted the open source code, of source code, sorry, of, of Feka. And published the empty package to uh, NPM, the uh, packaging, uh, under version uh, uh, 666, symbolically enough. I like the fact that, by the way, the, uh, the icon, uh, the logo is uh, the magician's hat, and poof, it disappeared, the source code disappeared. And imagine what happened to those who automatically upgraded to the latest release from NPM. Uh, Faker uh, receives like 2 million weekly downloads uh, back then. Uh, also quite popular as a dependency on JavaScript and Node.js projects. So just imagine what that meant. Uh, and to his defense, by the way, uh, he gave heads up a couple of months earlier. He gave this uh, 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 in, in the GitHub issue saying, no more free work from Iraq. Um, so uh, I'm no longer going to support Fortune 500s. Pay me or fork it. So uh, that was the, the heads up call. No one listened to it, of course. And he didn't end up with Fega. A few days later, three days later, at uh, January 8th, Marak published a new version of the Colors library with uh, an offending commit. You can see the, the code here. Uh, essentially, an infinite loop, which effectively creates a denial of service to any, uh, any Node.js server using it. And the Colors NPM is even more popular than Feka. 20 million downloads uh, a week, used by more than 4 million other projects on GitHub. And obviously the release immediately started the ripple effect of breaking numerous uh, uh, popular projects, including, by the way, the AWS CDK, a very popular uh, 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 library, I'm sure that you'll agree. So uh, until NPM rolled it back and stopped this ripple effect, and then he wrote a blog post uh, titled Monetizing Open Source is Problematic. I think the title says it all about why, why he did that. It's important to check your dependencies before you report them. That, that's a very good point. I'm going to uh, make note of that now in the, in the talk. So uh, thank you. So let's talk about learnings. We had already one learning here, so it's definitely a good, good uh, thing. So the case study, so what can we learn? And I want to share the learnings for building open source for using open source uh, and for vetting new open source for your, uh, for your company. And the first one, let's start with the, actually from building open source. So if you do decide that you want to release an open source, please remember open source is not a business model. Okay? Uh, 
the problem isn't with the commercial vendors, it's with the commercial incentive. Okay? So if you're a vendor, and if you choose the open source path, you should build a sustainable business model. Uh, those who don't end up in conflict between the open source community side and their uh, business needs and end up relicensing defending, uh, defending, uh, defensively and pulling off these uh, rights ratchets and all these uh, uh, things on their users. Uh, not to mention the ripping off of the community members uh, that contributed the code and time and, uh, and uh, uh, to further the project and that's uh, a separate topic about uh, the contributor licenses and how to achieve that. Uh, I'm not going to be covering that now. Uh, so that's if you're a vendor. And if you're an individual, remember we can be a vendor owned or, a, or an individual maintainer. If you're an individual maintainer and if you decide to open source a project, my advice for you is don't expect, don't expect material compensation. Yes, even if all the Fortune 500s use your library, do not expect uh, material compensation. If you want to make money out of coding, lots of uh, jobs out there for coding, if you go down the open source path, understand that this is, this is not the way. Uh, or, of course, you can establish a vendor entity around the open source, uh, like uh, Confluent did with Kafka, or uh, and a Chronosphere did with M3DB, or, or things like that. And then, of course, remember my advice before for the vendors. So that's about building open source. If you're using open source, here's how to keep safe. First of all, manage your third party licensing exposure, just like you do for your security exposure. Uh, so prefer the least restrictive licenses that meet your needs uh, and look for license contamination, like Apache 2 containing AGPL, things such as that. Uh, so that's the advice that we heard before about being aware of the licensing. By the way, all this trend of S-bombs and mapping your dependencies with S-bombs can also very well benefit this need as well, not just security. Also take care with automation. Uh, license compliance checks uh, need to be made before uh, updating third-party versions. Uh, we all love automation here in this uh, conference, but beware with automation without safeguards in that respect, okay? Um, just think about those who updated automatically from uh, version 7.10 to 7.11, a minor release of Elasticsearch, what happened. So, uh, beware. Also, uh, be, be cognizant of code smells. Code smells can actually, in the open source, can signal uh, uh, that something uh, is, might be uh, fishy. It can buy you some time to act proactively rather than reactively. Uh, remember in the example of Elasticsearch and Kibana, code smells such as mixed code licenses, uh, uh, dial home features, things such as that. Uh, of course it requires some familiarity with the source code, but many of you are power users that do go in to understand how the code works, if not to, to modify. So when you go in, remember to, to pay attention to these things. And uh, if you find yourself needing to tweak the open source after, after all, uh, prefer extending the open source using plugins rather than modifying the source code. That's much more difficult for uh, someone to, to block you from uh, writing extensions than modifying the, the source code as well. So that's for using open source. And if you are vetting new open source, here are a few uh, things to consider. First of all, obviously, the, uh, which open source license is being used. Not all open source licenses is uh, equal. Uh, so it's important to understand the, di the differences uh, and remember that uh, source available is not open source, okay? Uh, that's uh, first. Secondly, understand who's behind the open source. We saw it could be a uh, uh, one-man show, so it's a single point of failure. Maybe you want to be aware of that. It could be a vendor. Maybe it can uh, pull the rug. Uh, maybe you can find yourself in a rights ratchet uh, situation. So uh, obviously foundational open source provides a bit more of a, a safe ground in that respect. Also understand what's the governance policy of that project. How they ensure that there's no single uh, uh, entity who grabs control. Uh, what's the promotion path to contributor, to maintainer, uh, who can review, who can approve PRs. Ultimately who can do such move as a relicensing. And uh, if you are a, concerned about these, this exposure, of course, you can go down the path of 
uh, vendor distros uh, that can provide you shielding from uh, these, uh, this exposure. Uh, distro is essentially a packaging of the upstream projects, just as, a, as, a, as a something that is made available by a vendor with including some support. So uh, uh, in indemnification is the most important thing, so you're not exposed directly to the legal parts. And of course, you get some uh, certification on hardware and, and other things such as that. Uh, some of that also provided as a managed version and uh, of course on the way you'll help fi fund the open source because most of these uh, folks are the ones also then contributing and funding the, uh, the projects themselves. So just to summarize, open source is more than a license, okay? And open source can turn to the dark side in uh, several ways that we've seen. It can be relicensed, it can go rogue, uh, it can uh, otherwise pull the rug underneath you. It can happen to veteran projects such as uh, Elasticsearch, a decade old project. It doesn't have to be just young projects. It could be happen anytime. Uh, so beware of that. And also uh, beware of this bait and switch stunt. Uh, it's, uh, Concerning to me to see uh, the rights ratchet model spreading. I wrote a blog about uh, is vendor owned open source uh, an oxymoron. You have the, the link there in the QR code. Uh, so it's, it's a risk. And for yourself, select uh, open source wisely. We talked about managing the license exposure, don't auto uh, update without safeguards. We talked about code smells. Uh, build open source wisely. We talked about open source. Uh, not being a business model. Remember that open source is not a business model. If there's one thing to take out of this talk, <laughs> take this one. And uh, I, I, it's important because I don't want to see people losing trust in the open source. Uh, th so uh, it's important uh, that this vendor's bait and switch stunt is, is something that does not make people lose faith. And always ask yourselves, um, who is the hour in source? Who is actually be behind the open source that you use. So uh, these are my tips uh, and my experiences and uh, happy to uh, answer questions if we have time. I don't know if we have time. Please. Yes. So um, if they change license, aren't they breaking the old license? They're, they're changing from a certain version onward. So if you were in Elasticsearch 7.10, for example, it was still Apache 2.0, they released this announcement. The, the following version that came out like three weeks afterwards or so was already in the new license, SSPL. So, but they're not building something new. If they build something new, they can use a new license. But they're using all the old code, which okay. is under the old license, in the new version. So, so they're basically breaking the old So the, the license, license is for the version of the released software. The fact that it's based on an older code is what I mentioned very briefly about the contributors that contributed the, the original code. But essentially each, each package, if you'd like, or each release comes with its own uh, code. So uh, the new release comes with a new code. You can say, but what about the contributions that were made in the past that brought you to that point in time? And that goes to the, the rights, who owns the, if, if they own the, in the, put it plainly, if they own the, the code, they can decide that they want to change the license. So they don't hurt uh, you as an end user. The, 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 the delicate po very, but very important point is about hurting the contributors from the community that contributed that code originally. Uh, I hope that I answered your question. The users get a package, get a version, yeah. So that, that's what I mentioned before when I said contribute to licensing. Uh, there's a, yeah. Um, but project without the contribute license agreement are not allowed to change the code unless all the contributors change it or agree with the license change. So. Uh, so, the CLA are dangerous. so you're right, and I mentioned that very briefly, but I didn't want to open because it's a whole different talk about uh, about the contributor licensing. But what he said, just to repeat, because people might not have heard. There is an aspect that I mentioned before about the contributors that contributed the source code from the community. They, are, they were signed, they signed the CLA, uh, a contributor license agreement, and essentially what they, they gave up their right on the code 
they granted it to the entity that controlled the, the project, which ultimately was behind the scenes was the vendor, and the vendor changed the license, and it, it could do that. Other types of uh, agreements with the contributors have different terms. There are DCOs and others, and actually well, there's a distinguished gentleman here that probably uh, will have more uh, to say on that, if that's the why they, you're raising your hand. No. Okay, so I, I hope that I, so just before I take your question, so that was in a nutshell, and I agree with you, it's a whole different thing. There are others that were not even the ones that released an open source without even understanding that they need to put some sort of agreement with their contributors, that's even more complex. Uh, so yes, the, the, the delicate point is not with the end users. You asked what about the end user, but they were counting on a, on a code. That's not the concern. The concern is actually with the contributors, and the contributors might say, but I, the, I gave my time and my uh, energy and effort for free because I thought that I'm giving it to the community. Now you're taking it and making it your own. So that's the delicate point, but the very important point. Um, I hope I answered the question. Yes, please. So, uh, I really enjoyed your talk, so thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I want to push back on one point, and maybe you could uh, reply. Um, I thought that your fear of AGPL that you were expressing a little bit was mostly FUD, and I think that usually in practice it only affects companies who have either bad license hygiene or who care about benefiting from the free code without giving back. And I wondered if you agree with that statement. So just to repeat the question, uh, so he said that uh, my statement uh, about AGPL, AGPL, this, this is the copyleft license that I gave an example with Grafana Labs, um, uh, that it's a bit of a FUD, fear, uh, uncertainty and doubt, uh, because it's a fair enough a license, it's an open source license and it may fit, and it may not fit, just these companies that don't, don't want to give back to the community, uh, just want to consume. Um, so. Before going into my point of view, I will just say the CNCF itself, with an open source foundation, found AGPL to be inappropriate for their projects. So I, I don't think it's my personal opinion. I tried actually to, uh, to give a very uh, objective opinion. I showed other companies that just feel that it's a business risk for them. So, and I, I, I think that Google, by the way, is not a good example. Google said that it does not, it bans AGPL license from their company, and they are the biggest Actually, I saw this morning uh, uh, Chris, uh, the CTO of uh, the CNCF, just pub posted, uh, tweeted about the latest stats. I don't know who saw that. Latest stats of open source contributions. He showed the ranking, and the highest ranking uh, company in open source contribution and activity is Google. So they can't be blamed by, for not contributing back to the community. And they're concerned. They're concerned not because they're not contributing back to the community. They're concerned because they provide a SaaS and the level of exposure, business-wise, for the company by using AGPL and at some point someone would say that some, some peripheral software of a software might be somewhat infected is a business risk uh, that uh, many people find. If they have bad hygiene, it's a problem. If they don't want to give back, it's a problem. If you have good hygiene and you're okay contributing back, then it's not a problem. So uh, he mentioned hygiene and he mentioned contributing back. These are two very important points that I want to address. Uh, one is hygiene. Hygiene came back to, remember if I said that S-BOM, for instance, if you use S-BOM, that's a great tool, not just for security, but also for uh, mapping out your license contamination. So I agree. The fact being that many organizations have such complex dependency tree, look at the S-BOM movement, that it's very, very difficult to uh, uh, understand all the exposure points. And then it comes virally, so it gets uh, inf uh, 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 infectious in this way, it's just something that some people, just, some organizations just prefer to avoid. That's about the, the license uh, hygiene. And about contributing back, that's, that's a tricky point. Each organization and each business needs to decide where it draws the line between the part that is common enough for the organization to contribute back and the part that is a differentiation that they want to keep inside. And they want the, the freedom to choose where to draw the line per the organization's uh, uh, business plan, incentives, and strategy. When you have this uh, uh, infectious element that uh, uh, becomes a risk because it takes some of that decision away from you. So I think that the, uh, the aspect of uh, not contributing back sounds bad and I think as I said Google is a great example of a company that does contribute back but some things that they want to keep their own to be the billable uh, paid service they need to be able to have the, free, the business choice uh, in their hands. Uh, I hope that I answered for you, and we need to uh, wrap up, sorry, but I'm, I'm, I'll be here and I'll be glad to take more questions. Uh, so I'm Dotan Horvitz, thank you very much, and may the open source be with you.